So I'm gonna share my screen and stop the video. And da, 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 da. let's see where, where I have my presentation. Okay. So I guess you can see it well, right? Yes. Well, okay, thank you so much. Um, it's a bit of a pity uh, to do a presentation after Gabriela because <laughs> she usually does a very nice presentation. Now I feel like, oh, no, it's, it's me who has to present. But in any case, well, my name is Juan Luis Jiménez Laredo. Uh, I'm from the University of Leapa, Normandy. And that this is Spanish accent is because I come from originally from Spain, actually. Uh, so I'm going to present a method for estimating the computational complexity of multimodal functions done in collaboration with JJ Merello of the University of Granada, Carlos Fernandez from the University of Lisbon, and my colleague at the University of Leabre, Eric Salaville. So, um, yeah, this paper is about multimodal optimization. So why not starting by posting us the question, what is multimodal optimization? So we can say that multimodal optimization is actually when you have a problem that doesn't have one, but multiple solutions here. Well, that can be applied to uh, continuous optimization, like this is the case here, uh, or discrete optimization, doesn't matter. So, but yeah, basically it's that, like you don't have one solution, you have multiple solutions. So the thing is that usually you can treat a multimodal problem just as an additional feature to a problem. So if you think about unimodal, you can have many defining characteristics of the landscape, like you may have a yield conditioning or you may have a convex space or something like that. So we could treat potentially multimodal, multimodality as a new feature in the sense of, okay, in unimodal, we are just trying to find a problem optima. Here, we are gonna just try to find one problem optima out of all, uh, out of all possible optima. But more interesting, and in the, in the sense that this uh, presentation is moving, is that multimodality can be treated as a new kind of problem in the sense that, okay, we are not gonna look for one of the, the optimum, we are going to look for all of them. So that's a bit the, the, the approach that we are trying to, to we focus on, on this kind of approach. That reminds you certainly of the competi competition on niching methods for multimodal optimization. Indeed, uh, most of uh, state-of-the-art uh, progress in this area has been done around the benchmark proposed in this competition that was first launched in CEC 2013. So the benchmark is composed of, uh, if I'm not wrong, up to 20, 20 functions, I think, going from simple unimodal uh, function, simple ones, and up to 20 dimensions. So you have a, a variety of multiple, multimodal landscapes, and the aim is finding, locating for each problem, all the problem optima. At times you have these deceptive attractors like this one, at times you have, well, here, or in this case, you have all, all, all our um, global optima. So the thing is that here, the, the, the authors of the benchmark, they establish a maximum computa computational budget for each problem. So usually, uh, basically, they, they establish this uh, maximum budget uh, based on dimensionality. So for one dimensional problems, if I'm not wrong, the computational budget is 50,000 evaluation. So you can go that far. I'm sorry, I'm inviting people, admitting Nuno. And, okay, these people are coming. So, um, so yeah, this for one dimensional problem. If, uh, if you go to two dimensional problems, usually the budget is of, uh, 200,000 evaluation. And if you go to three dimensional or higher dimensional problems, the budget is 400,000 evaluations. So we may say that basing the 
computational complexity or the maximum budget on the dimensionality is not entirely fair. And I'm going to try to illustrate that with two problems. They both belong, these two, Vincent and modified rust region, they both belong to the benchmark. And they both, as they are two-dimensional problems, they both have a maximum computational budget of uh, 200,000 evaluations each. But if you have a look, intuitively, you can see that Vincent is actually way more harder than rust region. So this, there's this idea of computational complexity that so far is not so clear, but you can see that, yeah, tracking this little uh, problem, well, basin of traction, it's gonna be tougher than finding this one, but it's gonna be tougher in, in general, the Vincent function with respect to this modified rust region. So how can we estimate the computational complexity? This paper is a bit about that. Well, just an estimate, okay? I'm, I'm not saying, well, this is the computational complexity. It's an estimate about. So let me share with you some preliminary thoughts uh, we had about, about this. So let's start playing and let's start playing simple. So for that, uh, start with a, a simple sphere function. So a unimodal function. And our idea of computational complexity has to do with the mind of this guy. This is a dart player, okay? And the dart player is it's not that good, actually. He's just able to do one thing good, which is he is able to play uh, uh, uniformly at random a dart within the boundaries of, of the problem. And then the dart, well, we don't care that much about the dart, but the dart, we can assume that he has a method, we, call it, we may call it M or whatever, that is, is able to, to follow the, the gradient within the basin of attraction and end up in the, in the problem optimum. Okay, this is unimodal, and in the head of this dart player, he may say, well, yeah, this game, unimodal, you know, is easy. So, co so computational complexity is not that, that hard. But yeah, well, if you take a picture of a multimodal problem, you may say, well, this is uh, actually something, something else. This is gonna be harder. So here is where we define our idea of computational complexity in the, in the sense of this work. Uh, that would be something like estimated, the estimated number of trials of the dart player that he requires to hit all basins of attraction at least once. So how many times this guy that knows just how to launch darts uh, at random, how many trials he has to do to be able to locate at least once all the different uh, basins of attraction. So for that, I propose you to go professional. So we are talking about the dart player. So let's use a dart board. As you know, in a dartboard, we, we can play many, many different games. So I usually play cricket, but here for the purpose of the paper, we are just gonna play, it's gonna start simple with the unimodal game. And here the unimodal game, let's assume that this is just, okay, we have the dartboard and the guy is gonna have to hit the bullseye. So the area here in red. So, the question is how many trials, the, the guy asks himself, the dark player, how many trials do I have to try in order to, to be able to, to spot on, to hit the, the bullseye? So let's assume that N is here, the number of trials. Obviously, in this scenario, it's relatively simple to do some probability. And um, if we take, for instance, N, the number of trials, and let's say that B sub I is the area here in red of the bullseye, and A is the total area of the, well, dartboard or, or of the problem, we can just compute so easily for a single trial. So if we launch a, sim a simple dart, this is the uh, simple probability. So the probability of hitting the bullseye will be the probability of success. So the area of the bullseye divided by the total area of the of the whole of the whole problem let's say so this is for a single trial we can develop actually this formula for this equivalent one so this and this are are the same and now the question is well this is for one trial what happens for n trials 
Since every trial is an independent event, we just can obtain that actually the probability of hitting um, the bullseye after n trials is this formula. Here we could potentially clear the n and say, well, for an, a given n, we are going to obtain this probability. So, so far, I think should be easily, easily understandable for, for everyone. But I remind you, we are playing here the unimodal game still. So this is um, kind of an easy problem. So what about if we have the multimodal game with the dart, still with the dartboard? And now what we have to do is not hitting the bullseye, but hitting, hitting here uh, in red in the triple ring of the dartboard, hitting these 10 uh, targets. So what is the... Com Co complexity or the number of trials that this guy is going to need to hit at least one uh, every and single one of, of the different targets. Okay, for that, let's take all the previous elements that we have. So n, the number of trials, b sub i, b sub i, it will be the area of any of these different targets. Here, it turns out that they are all similar areas, but nothing, well, yeah, nothing, you could potentially have uh, different, different sizes of areas. And then we have A, which is the whole problem area. And the new element that we have is M, which is the number of targets. So here we have 10 targets. Before in the previous case, in the unimodal game, we just had one. So what we can, what we can do here, is uh, establishing an estimate for this probability of B, uh, B upper B, uh, uppercase B. This probability of uppercase B is not more than the probability of hitting at least once every single um, target. So if you, you can see here that this is an approximation, right? So if you really want to to develop this problem, you will end up in one problem that is called the generalized version of the coupon collector problem. But this turns out to be a serious problem that has to be mathematically developed. And uh, I mean, it is way harder and we want to use this for, um, for practical, more practical purposes. So we end up with a simple formula, which is basically uh, we, I mean, the, the assumption that we did, which is not true, is assu ass assuming that uh, the probability of hitting one, each one of these targets is independent from each other. It is, it is not the case. But the error that you do here from when you have a number of trials superior of to 10, 20 is, can be neglected. So it's almost zero. So in practical sense, this is mostly equal. So this is the formula, if you remind, the formula that we calculated previously. So the only thing that we have to do is calculating for every basin of attraction or every target, this little formula, and multiply all of them. And that will leave us, well, this is the, the expression developed, and that will give us the, the probability, um, and that's it. So. Some results. Okay, I'm gonna show you some results. Not all the results, because the paper is uh, way longer <laughs> than this. So do you, do you remember these two functions that we saw before, Vincent and modified Rastigen? Well, they had a computational budget established of 200,000 uh, maximum uh, number of evaluations, both of them. So one of the things that we did in the paper is take the state-of-the-art uh, algorithm in multimodal optimization, the winner of last year competition, which is Hill-Ball EA, and run it for both functions. And those were the results. So Hill-Ball EA, uh, he's able to locate all problem optima in Vincent in 20, roughly 29,000 evaluations. And in the modified Rastrogen problem, he's able to locate all the problem optima in, in 400, roughly 400, 500, uh, 4,500 uh, evaluations. So the intuition that we had before that this problem is tougher than this one, it is actually, well, confirmed 
in the case of Hill Valia. But we want to just um, find a, with this uh, method that we propose to find, to establish a method for, for establishing this kind of complexity. So after running our method, we obtained these curves. These curves are basically, we, in the, with the functions, uh, function that we, we have shown, we compute it for different ends, though, so different number of trials. We computed the probability that all basins of attraction are at least heated once. So as you can see, if you have a little number of trials, your probability of heating all the basins of attraction is really small. And if you go up, it increases. And when it is sufficiently large, the probability is gonna be one. So you're, you're gonna hit all the basins of attraction. So this is for Vincent and this is for the modified rust region. We also conducted a, a Monte Carlo simulation for validating the model. So these experiments with the dots are Monte Carlo experiments to compute actually the real probability well, that obtained it empirically. And our method is in the red dots here. So here, what can be interesting is looking at a, at a high uh, probability. So near one, we have established that to a probability of 0 0.98. So by looking here, this is 0 0.98. So by looking here, you can see the number of trials that you require to, to hit all these basins of attraction. In the case of Vincent, this is uh, 18,000. And in the case of the modified drastogen, this is roughly 80. So you can see that also our method is capable of, of tracking down the complexity of one function and the other. So, so yeah. Uh, and then we, if you think a bit about, uh, this is a kind of a lower bound actually on the computational complexity. This is not gonna give you the exact computational complexity, but can give you a lower bound approach. Indeed, Hilbal EA, you can see that here, is um, so the state of the art takes a bit more than what is um, established here and uh, in the case of modified drastogen it also takes a, a bit a bit more so i'm finishing uh, so some final remarks so first uh, just well basically this paper just try to, to establish a simple method for determining a kind of a lower bone uh, bound on the computational complexity of multimodal problems. But yeah, the paper goes uh, way deeper than the presentation. So, but I didn't want for the sake of clar clarity, I didn't want to go so deep. So please read the paper if you are interested. If, if not, please don't hurt yourselves. And um, yeah, I would like to say that one of the things that is roughly half of the paper that haven't I haven't men mentioned is that we conducted based on this method. We conducted a um, we well we developed a synthetic benchmark to try all possible sort of landscapes and determining how what makes a, um, a multimodal function to be really complex. And one of the conclusion that we we arrive is quote here. So I'm going to read it. So the most challenging multimodal pro problems are those with a large number of basins of attraction where the distribution of the areas of the ba basins of attraction is positively skewed and where a large part of the solution space is not occupied by basins of attraction. So that would be like the killing machine in, in multimodal optimization. And then finally, as future work, the idea is based basically on the same idea. We have been able to establish kind of a lower bound. So try to estimate a, an upper bound and hopefully in future edition of the competition of uh, um, multimodal optimization that, that, could be, that could be used, this fair uh, upper bound and not, not the current one. So that's, that's all from my side. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any question, I am here. <laughs> so, any question maybe, <laughs> or no question? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, Juan Lu, I have to one. Okay. Okay. Uh, sometimes uh, multimodal problems or problems with several instances, for example, when you are optimizing or trying to, to optimize several instances of the same problem at the time, are considered like multi-objective problems. How do you think uh, on, on... Sorry, I, I have a return sound. So. Okay. Yeah. No. I, okay, okay, but I, I think I have understood very well your question um, because indeed is um, I mean I have come uh, to multimodal optimization actually because we are tackling a, a problem right now in neuroscience whatever the problem I, I'm not gonna enter into the details but basically we are modeling the C elegans uh, some neurons of the C elegans and we really need um, finding uh, well. We have realized that the problem landscape, whatever we are trying to optimize, is multimodal. But when we provide to the bi biologist one of the solutions, so when we hit one of the spots of the solution, uh, they are not happy with it at times because they say that, uh, well, it's not biologically relevant what we, we are showing. So actually what we need to do is to provide them with the whole set of uh, possible problem optima for them to decide um, uh, well, whether whether the yeah this biologically relevant or not, even though for our uh, fitness function is exactly the same, but for them they, they they can do a second read. So in that sense, I think is uh, a way similar to multimodal. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, not multimodal, uh, multi-objective optimization in the sense that usually we provide uh, not one but several several solution to a decision maker. So. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I, so, I, I mean, we are working with, uh, as I, we, you can see tomorrow, uh, with the prediction of glucose. So, so we can treat the problem as a whole, like a multimodal problem or something like that. But you can also treat it as uh, optimizing each day of the time series we have. So, so yes, yes, you answered my question. I think okay. I found very interesting your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. So you, you are talking maybe tomorrow about multi-objectification, well, dumb of uh, a name, multi-objectification, right? Like a problem, try... Well, well uh, in fact, I'm not uh, talking about that because uh, I, I'm presenting just a multi-objective approach, but we are working just now with the uh, less case... Um, selection and multi-objective selection and things like that that were proposed by Lee Spetos and years ago and we are solving the problem as a multi-objective problem so okay. that is related to, to your work in this sense okay well thank you thank you so much uh, to all of you uh, that was the last talk of the session and I think it's not fair for me to, to take more questions uh, well, I, I don't mind. I will be this afternoon in, in this poster session. Um, so thank you so much. I